Good morning. It is April 21st, 2014. This is Jason Horak reporting on the ongoing adventures of the Dodge Daytona electric vehicle. As you can see, spring is upon us. We have actually managed to shake the snow, finally, and uh, things are looking pretty good. All the snow has melted, and we actually finally have a nice day out. <laughs> Um, so, what we've got going on today is the Daytona is up on jack stands again. And uh, why is that, you may ask? <laughs> well, because it made bad noises. Um, basically what had happened was I drove the car all winter long through the slush and the snow and other miserable things. And, um, you know, it worked great this spring, uh, just as the snow was finally leaving, um, I started to notice a kind of a bad grinding noise uh, coming from the drivetrain in the electric car. Um, now I'm not really sure exactly what it is, um, but it was one of those things where it just felt like a bad idea to keep on driving it, make, making this bad grinding noise. Uh, sort of a metal on metal grinding, um, and I'm not really sure what it is, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyway, so up on the jack stands it goes, and the plan is that I'm going to pull the motor and take a basically spin it when it's not connected to the transmission or you know the drive shafts or any of that kind of stuff. Um, just get it down to the bare minimum um, and see if that noise still persists. Um, my guess is that it's actually uh, the bearings uh, in the motor. Um, perhaps they got some contamination in them, um, or maybe due to the rapid heating and cooling, um, you know, driving it in the wintertime and all the negative temperatures and so forth, uh, with the commutator heating up a lot, <laughs> uh, coupled with yeah, salt and slush and grit from the road and all that fun stuff, um, I'm sure it didn't do it any favors. Um, so, anyway, uh, so that's kind of the plan there, and, um, I'm going to reposition the camera to get kind of a close-up of what the sound is uh, that this thing is making. Be right back. Okay, I've repositioned the camera um, underneath the car, pointed directly at the motor, so you should be able to hear and uh, see the motor spin and all that good stuff. Um, and hopefully we can have it pick up on camera what sound it's making and uh, for the benefit of everyone listening here at home. So basically that growl growling noise, which is kind of hard to tell, um, it actually sounds much worse when the car is driving and it's uh, under load, uh, but uh, that was kind of the noise. The squeaking, I can kind of attribute that just to things being rusty and so forth after driving all winter and the salt and the slush and the grit on the road and, and that kind of stuff, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that's kind of what's going on there. and. Uh, I think the, basically the only way I'm going to be able to solve it or track it down is to pull the motor, you know, and spin it when it's not connected to anything else, like the transmission, um, and also not under any stress with um, the uh, just the way that it's mounted, just to see if it's maybe a problem with the motor or if it's actually something with my mounting setup. Um, maybe things have shifted. I'm not really sure, um, but anyway, my guess at the moment is. Alrighty, so here's a shot under the car um, of the motor and a little bit of the soliton uh, in action as I actuate the uh, the motor in neutral. And uh, so I'm going to run it in neutral both with and without the clutch. And um, unfortunately I'm going to be in the car <laughs> hitting the clutch so you won't be able to hear me. Um, but uh, just go ahead and listen and see if you can tell 
what sound it's making and uh, you know when it happens. So we'll go ahead and give that a try. Okay, so that was um, just accelerating up to, I don't know, about between 500 and 1,000 RPMs um, with the clutch, uh, or basically in neutral with the clutch uh, engaged, and then same thing with the clutch not engaged, and then finally with it in first gear uh, with the clutch engaged uh, doing the same thing. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of the sound that it's making and you know, it, it doesn't sound too bad when it's up here on the jack stands with no um, You know weight bearing down on the motor really uh, So I don't know if there's just something with the adjustment um, maybe with my uh, mounting uh, The motor mounts perhaps have loosened up or have flexed over time or something um, You know or if it's actually a problem with the motor the bearings uh, or you know, maybe an imbalance in the clutch somehow. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, so anyway, uh, the only way I'm going to find out is to actually pull this motor out and, um, you know, spin it freely. So that's kind of the plan. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get that all tore apart. And I'll be back in a bit. As an aside, uh, while I'm here in maintenance mode working on the car, um, you may remember that back at EVCON 2013, uh, I had melted the terminal on one of my Kalb uh, SE180 cells. You can see how it's a little bit uh, melted into the plastic there, um, and we had to break off the bolt uh, just to, to get the thing out of the car. Uh, so the cell looks undamaged otherwise, and honestly, it's probably fine. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of extra heat in this area um, that perhaps has diminished capacity, but you know, it's not swollen. There's no uh, physical damage to the cell other than the terminal being uh, melting into the plastic here a little bit. And so I could probably clean this uh, this guy up and uh, you know drill out that. Uh, that bolt and then actually reuse this battery in the car um, however just to be on the safe side we pulled it and I've been running with 59 cells um, for you know since, since Evcon um, so what I had done uh, re just recently is that I went out on the EV West website and I purchased a new Kelb 180 SE cell um, to match my pack theory being that uh, you know, same chemistry, while well, I can still get them, I should probably get one. I was kind of uh, surprised that I had to pay so much extra for the uh, hazardous material shipping fees uh, on, on this one little battery. Uh, these batteries are completely innocuous and uh, <laughs> unless you get something shorted across the terminal, the, the, this big old plastic Lego block is not hurting anybody. Um, and even then, <laughs> not for very long. So anyway, uh, so I just kind of thought it was a little bit ridiculous how much um, you know the government regulations and so forth um, you know require that we <laughs> pay. I think it was like thirty-seven dollars or something like that for hazmat shipping. But then when I got the box, I saw all these stickers on it, and you know the special box that it had to come in, and uh, you know, 
fragile, handle with care, this side up. Um, in this particular box, somewhere in here, that actually is a special hazardous materials packaging box. Um, and so I now understand where that $37 or whatever came from and why they had to pay that extra, although I still find it utterly ridiculous that we have to do that. I don't blame EV West. Um, <laughs> or even Kelb, uh, if they're the ones that are shipped it directly. Um, so it comes with a nice little uh, booklet, and uh, looks like we've got some bolts and some regular uh, washers, which we won't be using. we will be using the bolts, but not the uh, washers. Um, and you can see it's very well packaged. Um, you know, this, this cell is probably the most cushioned battery ever mailed in the history of man. Anyway, we're just kind of trying to unwrap it here a little bit. It's got, so it's got bubble wrap around it, inside of lots of layers of foam, inside a hardy cardboard box, and then it has bubble wrap around the cell itself, as well as some tape, packaging tape to keep the wrap firmly attached. Oh my goodness. Oh, it's sticky bubble tape too. So let's see. Really hold in there. Okay. Oh. And after watching this week's EVTV episode, I now know what the um, numbers on here mean for the uh, serial number. So it's an NSA 180. Uh, so it's 180 amp hour. Uh, 13 1023. So that'd be 2013 October 23rd. And uh, this is serial number 0007. Which, hey, you know, lucky number 7. What works for me. Um, so this battery is about two years newer than the rest of the batteries in my pack, <clears throat> but it'll be an interesting, uh, you know, bottom <laughs> re-bottom balancing experiment uh, to merge that bad boy in there. Um, you know, and why did I do it? I don't know. I 59 cells just sounds lame. You know, I, I like the nice even 60. Um, that way my charge voltage ended up being almost exactly 200 volts with 60 cells as opposed to, you know, 197 point whatever, um, <clears throat> and, uh, 196 point whatever, eh, you know, math, <laughs> anyway, but, uh, anyway, so that's why I bought it, and so this b battery ended up costing me over $300 with, uh, you know, it's about $250 normally plus the tax, plus in shipping and hazmat fees. Um, but, whatever. Luckily, it's only one battery. I didn't have to buy another entire pack. Um, so, in the coming weeks, I'll be going through the, the joys of re-bottom balancing my entire uh, pack uh, in order to be able to splice this new guy in there. Um, probably what I'll end up doing is putting it back uh, here, where the one that I damaged was. Um, just because that way it's very easy to get at. I can measure it and keep keep an eye on this cell um, just to see what it does in comparison to the other ones in the pack, um, which are, you know, two years older and have been beaten to hell, whereas this one's brand new. Um, so, anyway, just another project amongst many uh, going on here today. But I uh, just figured I'd give you the preview and un unboxing of the battery. See you in a bit. So while I'm at it, I might as well mention. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this is the uh, the left side motor mount right here. That uh, and so there's two bolts, one on either side here, uh, that I've just removed. And so this whole assembly lifts straight up, um, which takes. I don't know if I can get the camera in here very well, um, which is bolted to this metal plate, and so the whole metal plate will lift right up, even though it's still attached to the motor at the bottom with those four bolts down there. Um, so that's that. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention while I'm at it is that, as you can see from uh, kind of from this angle, 
a little bit. Um, you can see that the this metal plate kind of bends <laughs> right down there. Um, and that's a function of the amount of pressure that's being pushed on the motor and on this plate. Probably the plate isn't exactly the right distance, you know, from here on this side um, as compared to the original design. Um, again, I just took the original motor mount and I <laughs> bolted it up to a couple angle, angle iron pieces here. Um, and uh, which, as you can see, are kind of rusting a little bit on the edge, so I'm going to have to sand those down and prime them and repaint them. Um, but what I'm going to do here actually is I'm going to, while I'm taking this little motor up, out and everything, I'm going to remove this metal plate and go back to the old one that I had in here, um, which was thicker. It was probably almost double the thickness of this thing. Um, and uh, so that'll kind of be a lot stiffer and it seemed to work out a little better. Um, granted, if the angle of the plate is any indication, it'll probably push the whole motor and the transmission to the right, um, you know, by that distance, um, if it's thicker. But anyway, I'll, I'll play around with it, see how well it works. Um, I mean, there is a f little bit of flex here because this is, um, you know, it's, it's got rubber inside, which it's over here, inside the motor mount there. Um, and so as far as the angle that this thing goes across, it can be, you know, canted down a little bit, at which point it would be, um, you know, I don't know, p putting less stress on the motor or the transmission, maybe? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but either way, uh, it just seems better to have that piece of metal be straight <laughs> and uh, not bending like that. Um, since I have a thicker piece of aluminum already, um, that I used for the previous mounting structure when I had um, the power steering pump uh, right in here. Uh, I'm going to use that same piece of metal, um, but I'm going to cut it down a little bit and basically make it the same uh, shape and size as this one, uh, just so it doesn't you know hit on the drive shafts and and so forth. But uh, but yeah, so anyway, that's kind of one of my little side goals while I'm taking the motor out. Anyway, might as well try to beef that up a little bit and. Uh, feel a little more confident about the strength of that piece of metal. Um, I wasn't really worried about this breaking at all, um, but with the, met with the aluminum uh, just bending as it does, uh, it just seemed kind of like it was throwing things off um, by a little bit, um, you know, as far as the alignment goes with the transmission. Um, so, anyway, <laughs> what do I know? I'm not a mechanic or a mechanical engineer or anything, but uh, just would rather have that piece of metal be straight. So, anyway, that is another side project going on with this whole motor removal. Alrighty then, um, I know that I've documented the full drivetrain removal and reinstallation in a previous video uh, for the electric car here, but um, as I go ahead and pull it apart, I figured I'd take some shots um, just to kind of give it a quick overview of how it's in here and uh, what I do for removal procedure. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, electrically, the motor is simply attached with the two high voltage cables that go to the bottom terminals there. As you can see, I've un unhooked them. Um, and then on the left hand side, there's the uh, RPM sensor that uh, just has to be unbolted from the end of the motor to get it out of my uh, tail shaft motor support anyway, so that one I don't even have to unhook from the car, I just unbolt it and it's good to go. And up on the top, you can see there's the um, coolant sensor. So that's actually a radiator coolant sensor that uh, is from a Dodge Daytona radiator. <laughs> Um, and I just wired that into my soliton um, to give me a temperature reading. Again, it's just the case of the motor. Uh, it's not the commutator end where the real heat happens, but it gives you a kind of a baseline uh, motor temperature uh, that'll be displayed in my uh, EV display and data logger program um, so that you can tell what's going on with the motor, at least peripherally. <laughs> um, so anyway, mechanically, Disconnecting this motor, as you can see, I've got it on this jack stand. Uh, this is a motorcycle jack stand from uh, AutoZone. And uh, just kind of worked out well because it's a very hardy thing. It's designed for carrying large loads. Um, you know, the motor is only 140 some odd pounds. 
uh, but then you get the, the transmission attached to the end of it and it's a little heavy, heavier than that. Um, I'm guessing probably pushing 300 pounds for the whole assembly maybe. Uh, maybe not that much, but um, you know, with the clutch and the flywheel and the pressure plate and all that good stuff. Um, but anyway, so as you can see, the support bars under here are spaced in such a way that as they're under the motor, they're not hitting the terminals. Um, they give the terminals plenty of clearance. And so there's no pressure anywhere on the motor um, I don't know, other than directly underneath the large iron casing. Um, so that's that's pretty pretty good. Um, as far as like mechanically disconnecting the motor from the car, um, what we've got is on the tail shaft side on the motor mount there's four bolts uh, and to that metal plate that I made. And then up on the top of the car um, there's a uh, the left motor mount is connected to that. Um, so basically it's two bolts to pull that out on top and four bolts down here. <clears throat> and then the motor is uh, coupled to the transmission with this adapter plate. Uh, one of, two of the bolts actually go through this unit here, which is the um, front motor mount, the stock motor mount for the car, um, that uh, goes straight through that um, plate, a little metal or uh, aluminum plate and into the transmission and then there's a couple bolts on the back side um, and on the top as well of the that hook the transmission to the motor so really you pull those out <laughs> you gently lower the thing down on the uh, uh, nice little jack stand here and that's kind of it um, it's a little tricky uh, in my particular build mostly because of the battery box. Um, as you can see up there, the battery box is very close to the top of the transmission. Um, and so what happens is, is that the motor has to actually lower about a, two inches or an inch and a half or so um, before I can clear the battery box. And uh, so that means that I actually have to, um, basically the motor has to be on a little bit of an angle in order to pull it out of the transmission um, where the uh, input shaft from the transmission and the whole thing is kind of like, you know, tilted like so uh, in order to get it out. But anyways, it's a little tricky, but not too bad. And, uh, you know, it'd be ex much easier if I had a lift, but, <laughs> you know, a couple plastic uh, ramps and uh, some jack stands and there you go. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pry this sucker out of here and then I'll show you how the motor is when it's out. And the deed is done. Uh, as we can see, the transmission is now <laughs> sans motor. Um, and also from this angle, you can see the problem that I have when I'm pulling this motor out of here is notice that the top of the transmission is higher than the battery box. And uh, that ends up being a big, huge pain in the butt. Um, so essentially what I have to do is drop the transmission a couple inches in order to get the motor to slide out, um, which is just kind of a pain. Um, anyway, I have the transmission supported by this wonderful floor jack um, that has a habit of going down on its own, um, which is why there's a brick underneath it to prevent it from going down. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, there we go. Drive shaft and the whole assembly there, kind of cool. And so here is the motor in all of its glory. Um, so I've got it hooked up, traditional pair of jumper cables to a, with a 12 volt battery here. And this way we can kind of hear how it sounds when she's spinning um, and uh, try to track down, you know, maybe where that sound is coming from a little better um, than we could when it was just in the car. Um, so I'm just gonna do the old negative up to the negative. And the positive, I'm just going to touch uh, on here and uh, get the motor spinning.
So as you heard, we had a lot of vibration there, um, and definitely some growling and so forth coming from <laughs> uh, within the motor. I'm, I'm assuming that that's the drive shafts, or the drive shaft. I'm assuming that that's the uh, bearings, um, probably on the commutator end uh, primarily. But if I'm going to replace the bearings, I'm going to do both sides, um, and then the clutch moved a little bit while I was pulling it out of the transmission um, again just through the weight of the, the way that I have to pull it out it's kind of it puts a lot of uh, strain on the shaft there and it kind of moves the clutch around a bit um, so it's not perfectly centered like it was when I first installed it um, but it would kind of self adjust once it's back in the transmission um, and there's pressure on uh, the clutch fingers there so anyway that's where we're at right now um, I'm going to get in touch with NetGain and uh, see if they'll ship me a pair of uh, handy-dandy <laughs> bearings uh, for their motor and uh, hopefully it won't require a full shipment of the motor back to uh, Illinois or wherever it is that they're at. Um, so, anywho, I will keep you all updated on the progress and uh, that's it. pretty much it for today. Take care and have a good one.